Ed Bennett, and for the next hour, I'm going to talk to you about all the new and exciting developments in GP lenses. My primary affiliation, and I'm very proud of it, is with the Contact Lens Manufacturers Association, where I'm executive director of the GP Lens Institute. I'd like to acknowledge some special people who have helped me uh, with these, these presentations that I'm giving, as well as in my professional life. I will also add that in the position of being on the Council of AOA Contact Lens and Cornea Section, one of our primary programs, and we would welcome you as members, is really to try to stop the illegal sale of contact lenses. And we're doing this by a number of programs. Where you can help is if you have a patient who's been harmed by a lens they received illegally, or even you've noticed an online or bricks and mortar establishment that has sold lenses illegally, look at this email, stopillegalcls at AOA.org, and you can email them to report that. Thank you. So what's going on in GP lenses? Well, it doesn't get any more recent than this month. Uh, we have the annual update article, which uh, we love to see. Um, Jason Nichols and Debbie Fisher, they reported on the findings in 2018, and you can see silicon hydrogels predominating. But when you look at GP lenses, you have 9% GPs, 2% hybrid. I kind of like to ignore this 0.4%, but basically you have 11.4% rigid lenses. Doesn't sound like a lot, but let's go back in time. Four years ago, same report, same survey. We had a total of 8% rigid lenses. So we are, in fact, seeing an increase. Well, what designs are we using? Well, according to the survey of the membership uh, this past month, they indicated 77% were in corneal lenses, including keratoconic, 13% sclerals, 7% hybrid, and 4% ortho-K. This wasn't a, a large number of respondents, especially the scleral lenses seemed to be a little bit low. So reaching out to predominantly Conomac with SLR's help, this is what they have reported the industry being. And you can tell 58% sphericals, 17% sclerals. If you single out keratoconus, it's 13%, presbyopic 9%, and ortho-K 3%. So especially GP lenses are growing. Looking at the five major areas to address in terms of GP lenses today, uh, these are the ones that I'll be talking about. Sclerals are number one, and the reason they're number one is when we did the GP annual report in October 2018, and I surveyed the contact lens experts in the field to get their feeling about well, what is the biggest development in 2018, and by far, the majority indicated it's new scleral lens designs and innovations. So we'll spend some time on that. We also surveyed the readership at Contact Lens Spectrum to get a feel for what did they use when they fit a regular cornea. As for example, example, the last 100 patients that they fit, what percent did they fit into these six different modalities? Now, if you look at greater than 20 percent, uh, Scleral lenses and small diameters really predominated. But if we really looked at truly what's your go-to lens, what do you fit in at least half of your regular cornea patients? And 39% uh, it was scleral lenses, 26% small diameter, and on down. So scleral lenses have rapidly become the go-to lens for fitting the regular cornea. Well, here's the four questions we want to look at and answer as it pertains to scleral lenses today. Do scleral lenses impact corneal transplants? I think you know the answer to that. Traditionally, we felt like 10 to 15 percent of keratoconus patients end up with a, some form of transplant. But we also know corneal cross-linking is impacting that, and there's studies to back that up. But also scleral lenses have certainly had a significant impact. I surveyed a 
a group of specialists a couple years ago to get their feelings about it and, and reported it in the GP Insights column. Specifically, it was the GP Lens Institute Advisory Board. I received 34 responses. 26 of those 34 indicated there would be some type of reduction, or there is in their practice, in terms of patients being referred for transplants. Four said they didn't have it presently, but predicted it in the future. Four indicated that at this time there was no reduction, although a few of those individuals said they really had been in a position where with their fitting expertise that they actually didn't need to refer patients. So that was promising, but let's look, let's back it up with research. And Coppin and her colleagues reported recently on scleral lenses reducing the need for corneal transplants in severe keratoconus. And let's look at specifically the conclusions of this study. 40 of the 51 eyes with severe keratoconus that would otherwise have undergone transplant surgery were successfully treated with long-term scleral lens, lens wear. So about 80% uh, of these individuals were prevented from transplants, and that's huge. Well, here's a hot topic. What about sclerals and intraocular pressure? And I don't promise to have the answer to that, but certainly while I'm having this presentation uh, with you today, I'm, I'm actually at the Scler Global Special Lens Symposium, and I know they've had several presentations on this, so we're going we're gonna to get the answer. It's an interesting topic, but it, it really started with Charles McManus, and he hypothesized that scleral lenses may increase IOP during lens wear due to compression of the episcleral veins. So is this happening? Is this impacting aqueous humor drainage and inhibiting aqueous outflow and therefore elevating IOP? A recent article and reported on a study by Lanji Mashad, and this was in Contact Lens and Anterior Eye. This was a very short-term study. It was a prospective study. It had 22 patients. It was just four to five hours of lens wear. They used two different diameters, see if there was a difference there, but also um, they were trying to you know, control for several factors that they thought were important. But the bottom line is that they were going to look at on short-term wear, did these designs increase IOP? Excuse me, in the short, in the smaller diameter, it increased from 10.1 to 14.4. The larger diameter increased from 9.2 to 14.4, so there wasn't any difference between diameters, but they both resulted in uh, about 5 plus millimeters increase in uh, IOP, and then there was also a mild increase in corneal thickness. So, you know, it raised several questions in terms of is this all happening due to the compression and the suction effect and and I think the real important factor from this is that this was just very short term. You know, this was four to five hours. We know there's other studies that are being reported. And as we get more long-term studies in, we'll, we'll have a more accurate picture of, of whether this is something we should be concerned about. In the short term, yes, I think it'd be good to check IOP at, at